and tell us to go. All right. I hope you're not checking my head off. <laughs> All right, let's see. We've, we've kind of had this word before. I had a brand new blue pen. Because Tammy said she couldn't read my blue pen. talk about, uh, you know, how we do the class, but I guess I don't need to do that, because I see everyone that I kind of recognize. But anyway, uh, hold up, road, road, the way, the way, right? So whenever we see hodos, whenever you're reading your, your, your Greek in Mark, and you see hodos, or hodo, or any form, it's the way, and that's what he means. Now this one is a little bit interesting. Uh, this is an E or U sound, K-O-L-O. U T H E I, and this pronounce the pronunciation is an is a H A pronunciation. So we get uh, in this case, akalotheo, akalotheo, akalothea. In this one, the thea, uh, akalotheo means a road. It's it's um, together with on a road. So this is a as in. Remember, A can be negative participle, but A can also be a joining participle in Greek. So A, kolotheo means way or road, so on the road together, which is kind of a neat word. I think I mentioned that to you yesterday. This is the one that I talked about, A-N-E-B-L-E-P-S-E-N. P-S-E-N is a... Um, uh, a suffix, a uh, suffix form, a declension form of the of the verb. This is Anna Blabo. And remember, I told you Anna Blabo. Anna means to up, up, look. And uh, okay, take you can you can take however you want. But the King James and the translators decided that Anna Blabo means to return, regain your sight. But in Greek it means to look up. Just because of the passage we have today, or had last week, that we'll talk about the end today. But it's just an interesting thing, isn't it? If I want to make words say what I want them to say, I just, well, I can pun them on fun you guys if you don't know Greek, right? If you know a little bit of Greek, whoopsie. But it's kind of funny, you take a common <coughs> word in Greek, which means to look up, and you make it to regain your sight. Well, how many words in English do we have to that means to regain your sight? Zero. Why? We don't need it, right? But do you look up often? Well, yeah. Everybody, okay, I look, I, I look up, I look up. I look up in an airplane, maybe not in ancient Greece, but I look up at birds. So, you know, it's not uncommon to have a word for look up but pretty uncommon to have a word meaning to regain your sight. I'm just telling you, you know, we got to be cautious because we take whole words and the translators have made whole words into theology. And that's nuts. That's craziness. But anyway, um, this word is one of those words. 
And, you know, I just can't get away from it. Pistis comes from pisteo. Pistis is the noun. Pisteo is the verb. Pisteo means to be convinced of a logical argument. Pisteo is translated in our Bibles as faith and, no, as belief. And pistis is translated as faith. Faith is a noun, belief is a verb. Yeah, yeah, but you got the point. Now, I want to make a comment about this that I think is very pertinent to the modern world. How many times did Jesus talk about feelings? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. You, you ever notice him saying about feelings in Mark? Has he said anything about feelings? Has he seemed to care about your feelings, or anyone's feelings for that matter? No, and he's going to even care for them less pretty soon here. I'm just saying, you know, we, we, we've built something funny. And by the way, who's biggest into feelings? Who's, who's the most closest feeling guy that you know about? How about the devil? Remember the devil told Jesus, go do it, Jesus, right? Turn this stuff into, into turn that stone into bread because you're hungry, Right? Why don't you follow me? Because it'll make you feel good, right? Right? I'm just saying. So what happens when to be convinced becomes an article of what you feel or think about? Whether it's true or not, right? I'm just saying. As a matter of fact, if you remember our magic, magic Greek words, these are the magic Greek words. Because they help us understand everything about Greek culture. Sarks, suke, and panoma. Where is feelings in this picture, according to the Greeks? Feelings come out of sarks. Feelings come out of sarks. They are pathos. Uncontrolled sensuality. Pathos is probably best defined as, you know, it, it's a love word, but it means basically rape. Okay? Uncontrolled passion is pathos. Pathos comes out of sarks. And how do you defend it and fight it, according to Paul and Jesus? It's okay. It's okay. I just want to point this out because, you know, to me it seems like the world is going, the Christian world is going more and more toward this feelings thing. And how far do you think feelings are going to get you with Jesus? I'm just saying, you know, just point this out. Anyway, um, other word. Let's see, the last word, you, let me see, that should be you, U-P-A-G-E. Not agape. Looks like agape, right? Mm -hmm. The sound here is H-U-P-A-G, and it's an O, but it's, the declension is E. Supage. Upago. It means basically from, let's see, I gave you the part, hupe. Hupe means under. And age, I go, ago, ago, ago means to, um, to, 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 let's see, to lead. Lead. So under lead. To lead oneself. So let's look at it because I wanted to. I wanted to kind of. Um, all right. We have not really changed the logos, but the logos changes pretty dramatically from one point to another. The logos has not changed. In other words, we are looking still at the same logos, right? It's Mark's logos. But you know what? Just like there was a great change where Peter made his wrong declaration, his wrong right declaration. Who he say I am? <laughs> well, he should have said you're God, but he didn't. He said you're the Christ. So it was right, but he was wrong, right? And so we have another one of those, but this is a goodness declaration. And it's really interesting where it occurs, because it occurs right after Peter makes his other kind of silly declaration, right? So in this declaration, you know, Peter says, we've left everything for you. Right? Another silly declaration because he hasn't. 
But in any case, we get a new declaration that kind of focuses the rest of the telos for the whole of the rest. And it is this. It is 52.10, which is, by the way, the last verse in 10. And this is what Jesus... Remember Jesus, the blind man, called him rabbi and did not ask for his sight. He did not ask for his sight back. That is not what he said. He said, I want to look up, which means he wanted to see the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Because that... Remember, what, did Je- what is Jesus' message? What was John the Baptist's message at the beginning of Mark? Repent, the kingdom of heaven is hand. And what is Jesus' message from the beginning of Mark? The kingdom is near. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. That is, it's the same message. And so the message Jesus has been speaking, okay, we want to forget that message for some reason, but that's the message. And so right at the end... You have a blind man, and the blind man says, because all the logos to tell us we've looked at have been about what? Who is, who's in the kingdom, right? Who is in the kingdom? You know, little, Jesus' answer, you have to be pure like a little child. You can't have any stuff, right? Right? All this is about who is in the kingdom. And so finally we get somebody, we finally get somebody who asks the right question. The right Greek question. And the right question is, if it's near, what? Let me see it. Let me see it. We well, didn't even ask to come in, right? Well, why didn't he ask to get into the kingdom? Why? He'd been listening to Jesus. What did Jesus say you gotta do to, to be in the kingdom? You gotta be pure like a child. And you got to have no stuff. Well, the blind man even has stuff, right? The blind man is not pure. Right? The blind man is definitely not pure because he's he's blind, right? So the blind man didn't even ask to be pure. He didn't ask anything but to see the kingdom. I want to look up. And Jesus cured his blindness. So then he could look up. And look what Jesus says in 52. This is what is so beautiful. This is the most beautiful. This is a stated telos. But not stated by Jesus. It's by our narrator, which is really interesting. Because we usually don't get stated teloses. Jesus said, go. Your pistis, go. He says, hupago. Hupago. Lead yourself. Not go. Lead yourself. Which is very different. Yeah. Is that a similar verb to like piso? <clears throat> which he used with his disciples was to kind of get back in ranks or whatever? No. It's exactly kind of the opposite. In other words, Jesus didn't tell this guy. See, why do you think he used opa? O- um, Opizo, opizo, optio, opizo, optio, with his disciples. They didn't need it, get it, and they needed to be led, right? But instead, to this man, he says, "Hupago, lead yourself," because what has he showed evidence of? Understanding. Understanding. Yes, exactly. So he says, "Lead yourself under," said Jesus. Your pistis, your, you have been persuaded, you have been convinced. You know the answer. You're not asking stupid questions. You're have, finally somebody, you're, can you see Jesus? Finally someone gets it and he's a blind man, right? So it says, your, your, your pistis, your persuasion, the fact that you're convinced of a Lego has not healed you, has suzo you. Suzo, did I have suzo? I thought I put suzo on as a, a word of the day. Did I miss it? Yeah, I did. Sure. Suzo. I didn't run out on the board. Suzo. 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 Which means to be safe. To be safe. Okay. In, in our, in our you know, translation, we like to say to be saved. And to us, saved means what? Sarg, uh, and Pneuma. In the Greek worldview, that's very similar. Suzo means to be safe. Sarg, and Pneuma. So 
to be safe. You have, you, your, has saved you, has saved you. Immediately, he didn't receive his sight. Immediately, he looked up at heaven. Now, the implication here is that what was he able to then do? He could see. He could see so he could look up at the heavens, and it says he, ah, kaleo, he went in the way with Jesus along the teen hodos. So, in other words, this man was not told to optio, but he led himself. He saw the kingdom of heaven and he led himself to follow Jesus. This is a declaration. This is a telos. It's still a kind of an unstated telos because somebody didn't take take everything and like, you know, you know, well, I guess you waited 2,000 years for me to basically take it and, and kind of explain it to you. But I think you read this, you say, in the Greek, you say, well, this is obvious, right? What's going on here? And look what happens. The very next statement is, this is a new verse. Let's see if I have any other notes here. I want to... Um, I've already mentioned this stuff, but this is a final declaration before we go to Big J, Jerusalem. And outside of Jericho, so we are outside of Jericho on the way to Jerusalem. This is a pilgrim trail, the pilgrim trail. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus, and by the way, remember what I told you last week? What did this blind beggar call Jesus? Son of David. He called him a king. Now, we have a problem. We have a problem, Houston. What is the problem? Jesus has got his Talmud, who's like, the Talmud are still trying to puzzle out this thing. And Jesus said, you can't have stuff to get to the kingdom of heaven, right? And so this guy, who didn't have a whole lot of stuff, basically saw the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, you're a good guy, right? And now, and we still have what? Lots of crowd following him. There's bunches of people following him. So Jesus has a little problem here. Somebody declared him to be the king. Now look what he has to do. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, and um, Bethany and Bethage at the Mount of Olives, okay, here's the Mount of Olives. I guess I can't draw it very well. Here's Jerusalem, Big J. The fish gate's here. The temple gate is here. Uh, they don't open the temple gate for most people. Um, there is a couple of bridges that cross here. And then there's, uh, there's a, a, the Kidron. The Kidron River Valley goes through here. And then you go over the Mount of Olives. There's Mount of Olives here. And then there's Bethage and Bethany on the other side. And so there's a flat top. And then there's a descent into Jerusalem. So you go up a hill and down a hill. In any case, Jesus Apostolo. Jesus Apostolo. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Apostolo. The word is what? Separate. No, it means separate, but what, what's the word? Apostle! Now, wait a second. If I pick you, I just apostolate you, right? And and Jesus is going to apostolate these guys go get a, a, a colt, get a foal. Well... Does that mean that if every time I ask somebody to go get a colt, I made him an apostle? I'm just asking the question here, guys. I mean, you know, when I say the word apostle to you, what do you think of? Well, are you one? Are you one? In Greek, if I ask you to do anything, if I set you apart to do something. You know, matter if I set you apart to make dinner, you are an apostle. But yet we've made a word, apostle, into magic. What's well, magic, right? It's like the gods. Just saying. You know, I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but you notice the word diakonos, right? Deacon. Deacon. Presbyteros. Elder. Right? We've taken those words that are just common Greek words and turned them into magic. And guess what? Strongs and vines represent that because they got 2,000 years of let's make magic. 
Let's make feelings out of the gospel. When the gospel to Jesus is what? Love us. Jesus doesn't care what you feel. Right? Like, for example, the Ten Commandments. It says, do not steal. So if you go to Jesus and you say, hey, God, I was hungry, so I stole. What do you think the answer is going to be? Uh-oh, chongo. Just saying. So, as they approached Jerusalem, he came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus apostolo, he set apart two of the disciples. And I don't think it was that special. May, may, and they don't say who, but I guess they were probably disciples didn't ask stupid questions. He kept the stupid ones with him, right? So they could, he could answer their questions. Because we don't know how many questions. Can you imagine these guys? I bet they're peppering Jesus with questions, right? And Jesus is kind of like going, flip an answer. Yeah, can you see this? Mark just said, I don't need to write this down. You got the point. But anyway, saying, he lego to them. He lego to them. Hupago. 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 Lead yourself. Lead yourself. Maybe two of the disciples got it. I wish he told us who they were. Anyway, lead yourself to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you'll find a polos, a fowl, a foal. F-O-A-L. F-O-A-L. A female horse, colt, <clears throat> tied there, which no one has ever writ ridden. Untie it and bring it here. All right. Do you guys get what's happening here? Lord, they're stealing it. Well, we're gonna we're gonna approach that because we'll see what they, that there's an answer to that too. But there is some real important clues here. Okay. Has anyone ever seen Bronco busting? Yeah. All right. So what happens the first time you get on an unridden horse? Not he doesn't want you on his ride. Well, it's, well, maybe horses are different in Jerusalem or, or in Bethphage or Bethany, maybe. Are they? No? Not in your experience? You know, do we have any ranchers here? I think if we had a ranch here, they would tell us, no. All horses have this thing about getting on their back. Yeah. You know, they do not like people on their back. And so the first time you get on the back... Does anybody see a miraculous occurrence, maybe? We'll see. If, if Jesus gets bucked off, then this is norm, a normative situation. If he doesn't, then, okay, it's never been ridden before. Predators attack them on the back, and that's why they're afraid. Yeah, that, that's true. That, that's the way you take down a horse or a, uh, that kind of animal. Yeah, do you have a question? If my memory serves me right, haven't we always talked about this as a donkey and not a, not a horse? Oh, yes. Um, now, Mark, I'm not going to go into math, the other ones, okay, the other Gospels, but Mark tells us very specifically it is a polos. Polos, in Greek, means a female horse, small, you know, a young female horse. Basically, you know what a foal is, right? It's, it's a horse that hasn't done what? Yeah, it's a virgin horse, basically. It's a, and a female virgin horse, at that. But it's never been ridden. Of course, uh, all right, guys. What is more dangerous to you? A stallion is pretty dangerous because they're big and tough. But is a male horse or a female horse worse for riding, initially? Okay, you know, a, a female horse, do you know why? Yeah. Because how do male horses approach them? And until they are in estrus... Until they're in heat, they do not accept it. They're made that way by nature. And so female horses definitely don't like you to get on their back because they think they are being mounted. Okay? So, you know, I hate to explain all this stuff to you like this, but, you know, I guess we need more <laughs> ranch training, right? This is, this is like, you know, I... I uh, I love to play this, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but, you know, all these things that, that we should have learned when we were in sixth grade, right? I never learned them. 
right? Nobody taught me these things, right? I guess if you lived on a ranch, you'd see them every day. And your, your father would sit there and put his hand on your shoulder and say, Honey, that's the way nature is. And he'd tell you about it, right? But in the modern era, you know, people think chickens come out of uh, McNuggets, right? So I'm just saying. But, yeah. Now, the Old Testament talks about uh, Jesus, or not specifically Jesus, but it foretells the Messiah riding in on a donkey. But does it say full? Do we have any idea? I didn't go look that up in... Uh, I probably should, and you know what's really funny <coughs> is I don't have a uh, annotation here about that specific verse. Maybe we'll get to it because I have some annotations about the specific Old Testament verses. But if anybody pulls that up or has that available right away, maybe give it to us. Anybody? Zechariah, Zechariah somewhere. Yeah. You have it. Yeah. Well, if someone has it, you give it to us. But, okay, but I had a question. I thought I thought the donkeys meant that the, that the king was coming in peace and the and the horses that they rode the horses. Aha, uh -huh. now, yeah. now, now that is the second point I was going to make, okay? The first point, well, I wanted to hit the first point because we seem to miss it. It's an unridden horse. Look, guys, if you told me, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that if you told me, we're going to go get an unridden foal and we're going to put you on its back, I would tell you, you're nuts. I don't like horses anyway because every horse I've been around, they step on my feet. You know, my kids always want to ride the horses, right, the ponies. And so I'm, I'm there helping my kids, and they still step on my feet. I hate horses for that matter. They weigh 2,000 pounds, for goodness sake. They're dangerous creatures, right? Now, if you're on top of them, I guess it's okay as long as they don't buck you off. I'm just saying, if you know, I want you to note this, that it is an unridden horse. And if someone said ride an unridden horse, I, it would scare me to death. Yes, ma'am, you have it? Yeah, it's Zechariah. Uh, verse 9. Yeah, go ahead and read it first. Re Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Interesting. So it's all of it? Colt and colt. A colt and a colt. They covered everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, now usually what I do is I look it up in the, set, in the uh, Septuagint, and then I, I check it versus the Jewish for, uh, Jewish stuff. I, you know, I try not to, I don't ever extend myself to be working for weeks if I had to go look up every, uh, his, uh, you know, his Hebraic term when I'm teaching a Greek class. But, uh, you know, let's, let's stick with that because I think that's a reasonable translation. But you notice, first of all, are donkeys unridden a dangerous commodity? Probably, so. yeah. They're actually easier. They're easier to get on than horses, but they they do not like to be ridden on either, mm -hmm. for the same reasons because they are herd animals and herd animals are attacked by jumping on their backs. And full donkeys are the same as full horses, but you notice that Mark does not tell us it's a donkey. Mark tells us it is a polos, and it's very important because <coughs> Mark's audience was Greek. And what's the other point of this? A king comes riding into town on a on a what kind of horse? Not just any horse. A war horse. Do you remember Alexander Gary? He had a named, trained war horse. And in, in the ancient world, and my you know knights of the round table, all these guys. They always had trained war horses. Trained war, what? Well, and you read my book, Egypt, you know, in the cavalry era, up to the World War II, up to the beginning of World War II, after even World War I, there were cavalry troops. You know that, right? Yeah. The Germans had a larger cavalry than any other nation in the world, and, and the Polish were the second largest. Cavalry. And cavalry horses are trained as war horses. What makes a war horse different than a normal horse? Accepting the loud noises of gunfire and stuff? Yeah, in the modern era, they actually uh, break the eardrums so they can't hear it many times, but they train them to noises. Wow, that's cool. And they, um, they also train them to attack. We think of horses kind of general. Have you ever been bit by a horse? 
ask them to bite you. They're they're horrible. They have big teeth. They have big crunchy crunchy teeth, and you know they're made to. You know they don't have multiple stomachs like um, cattle do. Why do cattle have multiple stomachs? Four. They like food. I don't know. Why why do they have to ruminate? Why do they have to have four stomachs? They don't chew their food very well. They don't have teeth to grind it up. Right. That's right. They don't have teeth to grind it up, and so they have to use stomach acids to do it. But horses have how many stomachs? One. One. Because they are able to grind their teeth. So they have very, very, very strong teeth. As a matter of fact, in some military, they would actually put things in the horse's mouth to enable the horses to bite you better. But horses also have something on the front. Hooves. 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 And, and in the Roman era, they, in the Roman era, they started to put horseshoes. One of the great inventions of the Romans was to put horseshoes on horses, which mean that the rocks on the road would no longer wear down their hooves. Now remember, horses are till, still okay. Get a lesson of horses. Horses are too small in this era to carry armed warriors. Well, no, there are no Clivesdales yet. The Clivesdales have not been developed. These horses are much smaller. They can carry a human being. And generally, horses in this era can carry the... For example, the Romans had two groups. If you read my book, I don't remember all the details, but every legion had basically like two or three groups of, of uh, cavalrymen. But the cavalrymen were used for what? Were they used for fighting? Never. They always got off their horses to fight. What were they used to, for? They're used for two reasons. No, no carriage. They couldn't carry stuff. Get there quickly? Get there quickly, but what? What did they want to do quickly? There's two things you want to do quickly when you are a, 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 an army. Scout. You want to scout and send messages. That's number one. Number two, you want to... No, harry the enemy. Harry the enemy. So... When you, when you get the enemy to rout, you don't want the enemy to stop. Because, it, and I got this in my book. If you read Centurion, you'll see all this. Because if they stop, then the, what can they do? Please. They regroup and they get ready to fight you again, right? And so you don't want that to happen. So when you, when, you, when you finally get them to rout, which isn't hard in the ancient world. The ancient world was all about nerve. Because their weapons, they didn't kill people. They were kind of yucky weapons. You know, they chopped people up and things like that. But generally, you couldn't get close enough to them. Because the people would either, you know, they had shields and stuff like that. And they defend themselves. Because people don't want to die. So the best, the way you fought an army is you caused them to lose their nerve. That's exactly, you didn't decimate them. You, you got them to lose their nerve. And then they would. Oh. Now, the problem is that anybody see a hockey game? What happens in a hockey game when guys are about to fight? They take their helmets off. They take everything off. They take their helmets off. I wouldn't do this. I'm, I think they're nuts. They throw their armor off, you know, and then they fight. Well, the opposite happens in the, in the ancient world. In the ancient world, when, when you get the enemy to run, what do they immediately do? Throw their stuff Drop everything so they can run faster. That's right. They drop everything. They throw their shields. They throw their armor. They throw their swords. They throw everything away in their packs because they want to go beat feet. Now, if you're the winning side, what do you definitely not want to do? Coming back. Yeah, well, don't drop your stuff. Can you imagine? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like a hockey guy. I'm going to drop all my stuff and run after him. No. <laughs> ah! You know? What do you do? Pick up rocks? No, what you do is then you have your, your cavalry carry them. And cavalry used to do basically, well, you could say three missions if you want. Messages, scouting, and herring. So the herring was to keep the enemy... From, from being able to turn and regroup so they could fight back again. So you want to, you want them to harry. And so what they usually carry, what do you think they carry? What does what do you usually see? Well Spear. Spears. Yeah. Pikes and swords. Mm -hmm. Pikes and swords. The because the pikes see you didn't necessarily you know, we always see the pictures of them running them through, right? That's the knights. Mm -hmm. No, you don't run them through. Them you get up close to them and you poke them. Because you want to keep them running, right? And if you have an opportunity close enough to one, well, you don't want to really get them close. What happens when they get close to your horse? 
horse. Well, they might hurt your horse, so they might pull you off. And the horses are great because you can eat them in wartime. Yeah. So the thing is that, you know, they had the, a gladius or a sword, the Romans guys did, so they would try to keep, you know, they would harry the troops, but if the bad guys tried to turn on them and get close, then they'd pull their swords to keep them away from the horses. They always fought, though, on foot. So when the cavalry was required to fight, right, when they weren't harrying or scouting, they would get off and fight. But you didn't want them to fight. Why? <laughs> well, and they didn't have armor. In, in the ancient, until much later, uh, until much later, about 1,000 a, a A.D., the horses couldn't carry you an armored troop. So your armored troops carry very little armor. They don't carry scutum. They don't carry a, a shield. They have very light weapons, you know, because their purpose is to scout and harry. That's their job. So, you know, a wise commander doesn't abuse his troops, see? You use them properly. So anyway, all this goes back to the point of war horses are dangerous creatures. Horribly dangerous creatures. You don't want to meet them, especially when they have a rider, because the rider directs them. You know, it's kind of like attack dogs. You know, they say, get him. And the horse will get you. They'll kick you, and they'll bite you, and they'll bite you with their heads. And if they have spiking things on their heads, I mean, you're toast, right? Because remember... Do you remember the spiky things they put on the yeah. on the heads of the horses? Why do you think? Because that way... I saw Ben Hur. I know. You saw Ben Hur, see? <laughs> By the way, that's why they had multiple horses on the cavalry, for a bunch of reasons. But I won't go into chariot troops. We're not talking about chariot troops, but chariot troops are a huge deal in ancient warfare, you know, until they were defeated, the big defeat uh, of the Egyptians back in around... I think it was 1,000 B.C. or 900 B.C., something like that. Anyway, so the way a king comes into his land is on his trained war horse. And war horses are generally, well, I hate to break this to you. You'd love them to be stallions, right? But trained war horses are usually geldings. Geldings. Yeah. Because when horses get that wild, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you don't want to be too distracted by other things in life. So and probably they're irritated, right? Because they've been fixed. But the the mostly the war horses in the ancient world are geldings, and they are trained for war, and they're big as they can get them, and they're dangerous. So Jesus picks an interesting pick. Completely untrained, female, <coughs> unridden, colt. Probably a fully grown horse. It's a false. <coughs> okay? In any case, it, this is a paradox, right? But you see Jesus' problem. He has somebody call him the son of David. And so therefore, if he comes into Jerusalem, well, if he comes into Jerusalem... Let's say he just comes into Jerusalem. Let's say he walks into Jerusalem. What kind of problem do I have there? Everybody's walking into Jerusalem. Well, not just everybody's walking into Jerusalem, but you're, you just declared yourself to be what? If you walk into Jerusalem, you could be a couple of things. Common. You could be common, Kunea, or you could be a prophet. Or I could be making a declaration. But there is a declaration that Jesus wants to make, right? Yes. But he wants to make that declaration in what way? I think, I, I would say a paradox. A paradox explains it beautifully, but also it fits in... He didn't have any choice. He had, right. he had uh, scripture to fulfill. Well... Okay, I don't disagree. Mm. I don't disagree with that. Now, you know, the detractors will say what? What will the detractors say? That Jesus did what? Because he knew the scripture. Yeah, because he knew the he scriptures. Knew he manufactured he it, right? On a scripture. He acted on it. But do you see what Mark is trying to do for you? He's writing to an audience that knows the Septuagint, right? But Mark is trying to show you what? 
the logos, the logical reason for Jesus to do what he's doing, right? And the logical reason was because somebody called him son of David. Has he been called son of David before? Nope. Has he been called rabbi before? Yes, he was once, right? This is, you know, these are cues. You know, these are, are really cool cues. Okay, so anyway. Three. If anybody asks you, here's, here's your answer. If anybody asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him, echo him. The curios. The curios. The Lord. We put a big L on there, but curios means just, basically mean Lord Mithras. But that's what curios needs it. And we'll send it back here shortly. We just hit another paradox. Kings do what to their horses? They own them, right? A king, does a king borrow a horse? In Zechariah, the impression is given that the, who's coming? The king is coming, right? The king's coming. And remember, the disciples think who's coming? Who's coming to dinner? King is coming to dinner, right? But Jesus didn't. You know, this would have been a different picture if Jesus said, go buy me a foal, right? Or how about this? Buy me a war horse. Probably couldn't afford it, right? <coughs> a little different picture here. If anybody asks you, tell them that the curious will bring it back shortly. Four, they went and they found a colt outside, not in the street. I should have given you this word. The word is amphodon. 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 <coughs> they went and found a colt at the fork in the road. A fork in the hodos. <clears throat> you know, if, if Mark hasn't made it clear already, Jesus is at a crossroad here. We all know what crossroad he's going to pick, right? But Mark just told you, he came, they came to a crossroad, to a fork. That's where the horse is. What do you think the horse is to Mark? It is a decision. It is a fork in the road. What's the decision? What's the choices that Jesus could make here? He could skip Jerusalem and not die. <laughs> well, he could march into Jerusalem on the back of a horse and declare himself Zachariah's king, right? Or he could enter Jerusalem in a different way. Remember what he said? He told them all the time. The son of man, who's the son of man? We don't know. The son of man is going to be beaten and died and la la la, turn himself over, right? And then rise again. <coughs> Some people were standing there asked, what are you doing on tying the coal? Six, they answered, as Jesus had told them. And the people let them go. Seven, when they brought the colt to Jesus, and epibalo, they threw their cloaks, their himation. This is very important. Himation is an outer cloak. They threw their outer cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Um, this is a miracle, a miracle beyond miracles. Because if I took a foal, a horse foal, and I threw cloaks over its back, well, what's the first thing that happens when you first try to saddle a horse? They kick everything off. These people, I, I don't know what's, you know, maybe Jesus was like doing his thing with it, right? Horse whisperer thing. Because the horse just <coughs> stayed there. And apparently the people were able to put their himation, their outer cloaks. Outer cloaks is very important. And look, he says he sat on it. This is a miracle. Now, this is just like the one where Jesus is walking down the mountainside, you know, over 10 miles away, and he looks and sees them in the middle of Lake Galilee. I can't see uh, an airplane at 10 miles away, all right? But he sees them having problems in the middle of the lake. Okay? This is one of those miracles, you know, Mark, everybody in Mark's audience goes, ooh, ah, ooh, right? And we go, Eh? Anyway. Eight. This is a beautiful verse. Mary, I think I gave it to you. Many people 
stronumai, strew their himation, their outer cloaks, on the team hodos. What is this symbolic of? Obviously. If you throw your outer cloak onto the teen hodos, you are submitting. submitting and casting yourself to the teen hodos, right? It's beautiful how Mark weaves this in here. While others, and look what others, it says, while others stronumai strew in teen hodos, and by the way, your NIV pulled it out, but it's in the Greek, it repeats it. They strew teen hodos, branches, stibas, and the words used in the Greek, stibas is a trample flat spread. I should be giving these words. These are really complex words. They, they, they strew in the teen hodos, stibas, a trample flat spread. They had beat the breast in, they didn't cut. They cop toe. They cop toe. They beat their breasts in grief while they... They got the brand, the stibas, the stibas, a trample flat spread of stuff from the fields. All right. Why? Why did they beat their breasts in grief? Now, we don't get this at all in the NIV. This is what the Greek says. Why did they beat their breasts with grief? Because they had to go out in the fields to get stubble to put in the teen hodos. Why? They didn't have himation to strow in the path. So they didn't have a ladder cloaks? They didn't own, which means they were poor. very poor. They're very poor. So, in other words, in this, pe this people that are, and there's large, apparently a large group. We don't know how large, you know, but there are many, look, this is many people, many people out of this large group. So this group must be huge, right? And the people that didn't have outer cloaks, the NIV totally slaughters this translation. But it says they beat their breasts in grief because they had to not get branches. They went out to the fields to get stubble, you know, the hay from the fields, to put in the road. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us three things, three very important things. Number one, what time of year is it? What are the roads like? What is the season of the festival? Or it gives us clues. Is it harvest time because of the stuff? There's it must stuff be after, after harvest. It's, after. it's after harvest. Okay, After harvest, there's junk at the field. They didn't take branches, so it's not... Mark intentionally tells us, because John tells us a different story about this. It's not Sukkot. It's not Sukkot because if it was Sukkot, they would have had... The lulaps, the branches that they used to build the... In, in Shukot, Shukot is a festival of uh, booths, and they build a booth on top of their house, right? And they build it of four different branches, types of branches. Can't remember them all, but anyway. They build it of the branches. And then they take the branches, and they take them to the temple during Rosh Hashanah, right? So this must be, or probably is past Rosh Hashanah. Because it doesn't say branches, although our translation misleads us. They're gathering stuff from the fields. Okay? And when they're doing it, obviously, why would you put... Okay, when people are walking, it's okay. When horses are walking, there's a little problem. Why would you put stuff down in the road for the horse to walk on? Rocks. Not rocks. Right. Mud. <coughs> so this is most likely, and by the way, everybody who can own them has hemation on. So this has got to be coming, probably coming out of the winter season to spring. So in other words, we're talking about Passover season. It's approaching Passover season, or maybe Passover season, or maybe sometime before Passover season, because there's you know there's very little in the fields. Beating their breasts, right? Wearing cloaks, outer cloaks. The roads are probably muddy. Okay for people. Why? Because people walk on the sides, but not for a horse, because a horse is going to go down the center, right? That's the way you do them. So, gives us some ideas about it. Um, nine. 
those who went ahead and those who followed shouted. And the word, I, I hate the fact they said shouted, because the word in Greek, the words in Greek are phrazo legos. Phrazo legos. They cried out a legos. In other words, they had made a conclusion for themselves. They cried out a legos. Hosanna. Lugeo. Logeo. Good logic. Lugeo. We say blessed. Lugeo. Good logic. Is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now why this is really important is because this probably isn't the season of Shakot. But when are they looking for the Messiah to come? During the... No. Shakot. During Shakot in Rosh Hashanah, that is when the high priest states Yahweh before the people. It's the only time Yahweh is said out loud by the high priest before the people because you do not use the Lord name of the Lord in vain. According to Josephus, he tells us the high priest only said the name of God at Rosh Hashanah. <coughs> and Rosh Hashanah is the new year. It's back in November, December period, right? That's when Shakot is. And so in Shakot, and during Shakot, this is what happens. Uh, Psalm 117. This is where this comes from. 117, 118. 117 is the shortest psalm. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Um, this is the 117th psalm always precedes the 118th. Never separate. And then the 118th says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me, he is my helper. Oh, by the way, and every time the Lord here is uh, Yahweh, but every time the high priest hit those, he'd go, Arr. He'd Arr. right? He wouldn't say, he'd either say Adonai, or he would just mumble it. Wouldn't say it out loud. Um, it is better to take refuge in the Lord, in Adonai, than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in Adonai than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of Yahweh, Adonai, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of Adonai, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of Adonai, I cut them off. I was pushed back about a fall, but Adonai helped me. The Adonai is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. Adonai's right hand has done mighty things. Adonai's right hand. Adonai's right hand is lifted up. The Lord's right hand. Adonai's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim that Adonai has done. Adonai has chastened me severely, has not given me over to death. Open the, for the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to Adonai. This is the gate of Adonai through which the righteousness. Oh, la, la. Um, oh, I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, not cornerstone, the capstone. Adonai has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day Adonai has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. In. Oh, Adonai, save us. Okay. Oh, Adonai, grant us success, and this is the one he says. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. From the house of Yahweh, we bless you. And then you know what he does? Silence. What are they waiting for? They are waiting in this moment. This is the moment in which the Messiah is supposed to announce himself. If you look at my book, if you look at John, it's, it, John is like right in there. If you look in, in Centurion, i got that right in Centurion. It's supposed to happen at Shakot, at Rosh Hashanah. Because what happens, and by the way, John puts it at Shakot, at Rosh Hashanah. Because what happens is that they are at the temple during Shakot at Rosh Hashanah, and this is said, Blessed is you who comes in the name of Yahweh. From the house of Yahweh, we bless you. 
Then there's silence, and they wait for the Messiah to stand up and announce himself. In John, guess what Jesus did? He stands up, and he says, I have water for you of the Holy Spirit. Right? This is a great, this is a thing from that. Now, Mark doesn't do that. Mark sets it at, specifically at Pensac, and they're coming. And the next words are this. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us with bows in hand. Join the festival procession up to the horn of, of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks, for you are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And when this happens, what happens is the priests take their lulaps, take their branches, and they go beat the horns of the temple. I think that's the first bell, that's all right. Because we will continue this, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem according to Mark, which is a little bit different than the other Gospels, but getting this perspective is very interesting. There's a lot more that we can dig out of this historically and culturally. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. Your name we pray. Amen. So you're saying the different Gospels put Jesus' arrival at different times?